Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, siblings. As we come into our space together, as we gather, take a breath, settle in, we will begin shortly. If you want to rename yourself to include the native lands upon which you work, live, or serve, please feel free to do so. As Interfaith Councils, we understand land acknowledgement as a transformative act meant to confront our place on native lands and to build mindfulness of our present participation in colonial legacies. As people of various faith traditions and life philosophies, we affirm our responsibility to amplify indigenous voices. We stand in solidarity with local indigenous communities and we respect local indigenous protocol we practice land acknowledgements in order to teach and promote greater public consciousness of native sovereignty and cultural rights, even here in California, where there are fir few First Nations that survived the California indigenous genocide and fewer still that gained federal recognition as sovereign nations. Our congregations and worship centers are located around the Bay Area in Huichin and Yelamu, also known as Oakland and San Francisco on the unceded territories of Chochenyo and Rametush Ohlone peoples who have continuously lived upon this land since time immemorial, as well as on coastal and Bay Miwok, Karkeen and Muwekma Ohlone and Patwin lands in Marin, Contra Costa and Solano counties and the Mitsun in the South Bay. We recognize the historic discrimination and violence inflicted upon indigenous peoples in California and the Americas including their forced removal from ancestral lands and the deliberate and systematic destruction of their communities, sacred sites, languages, and cultures. Each of us has a responsibility to oppose all forms of individual and institutionalized racism towards all people, but especially toward indigenous peoples as fellow peoples of faith who were robbed of their freedom of religious rights until 1973 and their voting rights until 1978. All of the over 750 treaties have, that they've made with our own country have been broken by our federal and state governments, including just last week, three other treaties were broken in Minnesota with the Red Lake Anishinaabe and Ojibwe nations, as I saw firsthand on line three in upstate Minnesota. We recognize that the cultural heritage of California begins no less than 15,000 years ago and that the entire Bay Area rests on evidence of indigenous cultures. The pre-contact indigenous population of California was one of the largest and most diverse in the Western Hemisphere and spoke over 300 Native American dialects as well as 90 languages. Today, there are approximately nine indigenous dialects spoken in the Bay Area and California is home to more people of Native American and Alaskan Native heritage than any other state in the country. There are currently over 100 federally recognized Native American tribes in California and even more communities and tribal groups, including the Ohlone who are not currently federally recognized. California has the highest Native American population in the country and Los Angeles and San Francisco have two of the largest urban Native American populations in the United States. Welcome to Bay Area Gathering of Interfaith Councils. My name is Girish Shah. 
I am with Jain Center of Northern California or Jain Temple and the Silicon Valley Interreligious Council. We are so glad that all of you have joined us today. We gather today for two purposes. One, the first one is to build connection between our interfaith organizations across Bay Area. The other is to learn from each other and begin working together on issues we care about. And today, we will focus on issues of disaster preparedness and the response that's given because we experience disasters that affect all of us. Before we begin, let me give you a few technical points. We will have time for discussion in breakout rooms. There will be several breakout rooms. Outside of those times, we request that everyone remain in mute mode. We also ask as much as possible, and particularly during the breakout session, that you have your video on so that we can see each other and that way we can get to recognize each other. Finally, you will see Herb Taylor in your, one of your, our co-hosts as in your participant list in your breakout room. If you have any technical difficulties, you can chat with him on that, uh, with him so that he can help you. It is now my honor to introduce Father Jerry Caprio, Executive Director and Board Chair of the Interfaith Center at Presidio, who will provide us our spiritual grounding for today. Father Caprio. Thank you, Girish. We approach our work today in the shadow of, of two significant events that have taken place in the last few days. On Saturday, we celebrated the birth of Mahatma Gandhi. And on Monday, the feast of St. Francis of Assisi. Now these were two spiritual giants who obviously seriously affected the world around them, even though they were seven centuries apart. They were ministers in the true sense, and they are ministers in the sense that we strive as, uh, as interfaith ministers. And that is what I'm constantly reminded of uh, by Rita Semmel, that our work is tikkun olam, to repair the world. And so the Mahatma and Francis, uh, their entire work was to repair the world. And in our small way, we strive to do the same thing. Let me add that there is a lovely prayer from Francis of Assisi, which I know many of you are familiar with. And I'd like to pray that now as the, the opening to our ministerial work today. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us bring your love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console. To be understood as to understand. To be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we shall receive. It is in pardoning that we shall be pardoned, and it is in dying to oneself that we will be reborn to new life. Amen. Thank you so much, Father Jerry, for 
providing that lovely opening for us and grounding us as we gather today. Uh, my name is Scott Quinn with the Marin Interfaith Council, and it's my joy again to be with so many of you who joined us in March for our first such gathering of our Bay Area Interfaith Councils. And today we continue and welcome those of you who are joining us for the first time, as well as those who are joining us again. So at that first meeting, there was a desire for further gatherings, a chance for us to go deeper and to build better relationships, deeper relationships with each other, and also to begin working together on some issues of common interest. So today, we'll do both those things. First, we're gonna spend some time getting to know each other and build some connections, both personally and between our organizations. Then we will focus on an issue of mutual concern. So at that March meeting, several issues were identified for us to address together, and we'll have subsequent meetings to take up some of those other issues. Today, the one that we're going to start with is preparing for and responding to disasters. And this is a good starting point for our mutual collaboration because when it comes to disasters, we are interdependent. A fire or earthquake or pandemic does not stop at a county line. An emergency affecting one part of the Bay Area affects us all. And one example is that the public health officers of our Bay Area counties coordinate their COVID orders so that they are in alignment throughout the region. Our response to any emergency, while very local, also needs to have a regional coordination. So where are we now as we collectively hope to emerge from the pandemic? What have we learned from this and previous emergencies? How can our faith communities better coordinate preparation and response with government entities and with civic organizations like the Red Cross? Today, we'll start to explore these questions. We'll hear from local leaders who have been doing this work and then have discussions with each other as we seek to better coordinate our independent responses during emergencies, responses that address both practical and spiritual care concerns. Let's start, however, with some time to get to know people from other interfaith organizations from around the Bay Area. So Herb, if you'd be so gracious as to put up our PowerPoint presentation that will take us through the process before we actually go into our breakout rooms. Okay, thank you. So, in just a moment, um, you're going to be prompted to join a breakout room. You'll be given an invitation. It should pop up on your screen. And when it does, accept the invitation. Um, if you have any problems, if some reason it doesn't happen, we'll sort you where you need to get, but it should be automatic. It should ask you um, to, to uh, join a breakout room. There's no need for you to do anything else because you've already been pre-sorted. So when you get into your breakout room, I'm gonna ask you to do a couple of things. So first of all, I'm gonna ask you to um, introduce yourself, your name, your location, and your interfaith council or organization. And then I'm also gonna ask you to um, take a moment to spend some time for each person to address the following. So how are you doing at this point in the pandemic? What have you learned? And how have you been resilient? And I'm also putting these in chat, but I invite you just to take a moment and write this down. So here are your questions to address. How are you doing at this point in the pandemic? What have you learned? How have you been resilient? So we'll have about 25 minutes total in breakout rooms. So about four minutes a person. So just kind of monitor each other and yourself just to make sure that everyone has a chance to speak. So again, introduce yourself, your name, location, interfaith council, organization, and then each person about four minutes to address how you're doing, what you've learned, and how you've been resilient. Um, all right, 
let's go. Let's have some time with each other. So well, it looks like we still have a couple of folks who are not assigned. Um, I believe he's assigning them right now. It looks like they're oh, okay. Yeah, this this is dwindling. Gotcha. Thank you, Will. Yay. We had a... So wonderful to have all of you back. Um, and gratitude to everyone who participated in our breakout rooms to get to know each other a little better. We, we'll keep doing this every time and and certainly uh, opportunities in the future for us to have even more uh, connections with more people from our various organizations across the Bay Area. Next, right now, though, we're going to focus on our topic for the day. So our speaker today is going to introduce us to the theme of the intersectional response of civic, government, and faith communities. Uh, during time of emergency and disaster. And our speaker today is John Ruiz. He is the Regional Disaster Officer with American Red Cross. Um, John is responsible for the overall implementation and management of disaster cycle services program, including preparedness, response, and recovery activities for the Northern California coastal region. He oversees the effective recruitment, engagement, retention, and training of a highly skilled and motivated volunteer and employee disaster workforce and the development of effective partnerships with community and governmental agencies within the region. So in just a moment, we're going to have John and we will have a little time for questions and answers. So if you have a question, feel free to put that in chat. Um, if something arises while uh, John is speaking and uh, we'll get to a couple of those. Uh, toward the end of our time of this segment. Uh, but right now we welcome John Ruiz. John, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Scott. And thanks everyone for the invitation for the flexibility. I know uh, we, we went through a couple different iterations of this presentation, uh, but I, you know, this meeting has a, has a bit of, a, um, has a little bit of uh, history with me. I, I was talking with Michael earlier when I first started with the Red Cross in 2005, I was the disaster program manager responsible for San Francisco County. And the first official meeting I went to was the Interfaith Council with uh, Michael and Rita in San Francisco. I didn't even know my job. I think they asked me a few questions and I really had not really understood the Red Cross at that point. I think I was brand new. Uh, so to be able to come back <laughs> so many years later to a broader group, uh, the Bay Area group, and, and to be able to talk more about our program is is very fortunate. So thank you guys. I really appreciate it. I'm going to turn off my camera, Scott, and load uh, my PowerPoint. Uh, and if you, if you can, at the end, we'll, we'll take questions. But if anything comes up, if you could just alert me, because I won't be able to see what's going on in the, um, in the meeting. Let me see if I could share my screen. It's always a challenge, so please bear with me. 
Okay, Scott, can you see the presentation? Yes, great. Perfect, okay, great, thank you. So again, a regional disaster officer. I've been with the Red Cross since 2005. Like I said, I was a disaster program manager for a few years in San Francisco. I left the Red Cross in 2013 as the deputy director for the disaster program, went to UC Berkeley for a few years and came back uh, about five years ago, a little over five years ago. And boy, it's been a crazy five years. Uh, in my current role as a regional disaster officer, not only did the world of disasters change, but our region has gotten a lot bigger. Uh, right now we cover uh, 15 counties from Monterey and Santa Cruz in the south to Napa, Sonoma in the north, and around to Solano, Stanislaus, San Joaquin, San Benito and Merced to the east. Um, so what I wanted to do is just to um, let's see if I can get this to work there. I, I wanted to give a broader perspective of what the Red Cross does. And then I'm going to spend a lot of time on the last two slides, really talking about the interconnectedness the, and how we work with the government, how we work with nonprofits and faith-based organizations. But it's helpful to get a, in my, my opinion, to, to give a broader perspective of the Red Cross. Uh, so it's really important for me that we start with our mission. Uh, this is really a touchstone for us that we work to prevent and alleviate human suffering in emergencies, and, and really important for us is the, the mobilization of the power of volunteers and the generosity of donors. Um, the volunteers are key to this. We are 90% volunteer driven, which means a lot uh, in terms of what we're able to do and the effectiveness we have, plus our connectedness to the community. These are local volunteers working in their communities and coming across, coming together across the country when needed to help others in their communities, but we've always been community driven. And sometimes it's a struggle, but we want to maintain that. And that's where I think our work with faith-based organizations and other nonprofits really makes a difference. Um, it, to give us broad scope, I'm not going to go into the numbers necessarily, but to give a broad scope of the role, not necessarily that the programs that I oversee, but the role of the Red Cross as a whole, we obviously respond to a number of disasters. It's about 170 a day across the country. And within our region, we do about 1,300 a year. So if you do the math, that's, you know, within our 1,500 or 15 counties, it's, you know, approximately three a day, two to three a day. Sometimes it's more. And these are single family fires, apartments, uh, multifamily fires. We've seen a lot of those, homes, um, and, and you name it. And we do uh, quite a few of those within our region every single day. Uh, we do blood. I don't have as much information about blood since it's not my program, but we do. 12,500 uh, donations. Uh, it, it, we do weather alerts. We work with our service to armed forces. We do do vaccination, which I'm not as familiar with. And then we do a lot of training. So I present this as a as the to, to show a little bit of the breadth of what we do within the Red Cross, not necessarily my disaster program, but as an organization. Locally, we do do a lot. And we look at our fiscal years from June through, from July through June and last year, we did a lot of work with our military families, especially around the military bases in Solano and down in Monterey, um, 6,471 cases. We've done a ton of preparedness in terms of first aid CPR, um, almost 60,000 people. And then we've done almost 4,000 blood drives in our region. And this is something that we've been very focused on, especially in areas to uh, where we can help um, uh, with blood donations for the African American community to help with some of the sickle cell shortages we have. Um, but I want to talk a bit more about disaster to, to set the stage for what we do. I think it's important to, to really focus on what it is we do during those disasters um, and whether it's a single family. And again, we do a multiple number of those a day to the bigger, as someone mentioned, Paradise Fire in our breakout. We talked about the Paradise Fire briefly and its effects on the community. Whether it's that or, or the Paradise Fire or floods, we, we respond to try and, and support the basic needs of those people who are affected with food and shelter. And it could take a number of different, um, it could look a number of different ways depending on the scope and scale of the disaster. We provide cleanup material to help them clean their homes and, and try and get back to some sense of normalcy. We provide them with comfort kits uh, so they can clean and bathe. Sometimes people leave without even some of the most basic things like a toothbrush. Um, we, we do provide financial assistance. It depends on the damage level, but we also provide health, mental health, and importantly, spiritual care to people who are affected. This is a big part of what we do. We're ramping up that effort. And I know Adriana, you work in Marin and uh, our lead for our region is one of our volunteers in Marin County and um, Ann Icorn 
is working hard to build that capacity. Um, but we, we basically try to meet those individuals, connect them with additional resources within the community, both at government level, as well as our faith-based and, and nonprofit partners to leverage all of that care to help bring people some sense of normalcy, bring, start their road to recovery. We are unable to get them back to normal, obviously it takes years and, and decades, but we just wanna help get them started. It's important, I, I wanna emphasize the last part that we don't do this alone. Um, we definitely don't see ourselves as the end all be all. We work with the VOADS, we work with uh, Suchi, all the other nonprofits, local and larger national nonprofits. And of course we work with the faith-based organizations as well. I, and I think this doesn't need to be uh, harped on too much. You all see this and the work you do, I'm sure, but it, it's different now. We, people who are in need are really, really in need. And some of the stats that we look at is people, if someone, 40% of the US adults who were to face a 400, unexpected $400 expense, they wouldn't be able to cover it. $400 expense would put someone into a stressful, very stressful financial situation. 47% uh, of, of the clients that we see have permanent housing needs. And I think that that number shifts depending on which county you're looking at. And it also impacts when we look at recovery and people moving out of shelters after large disasters, those shelters are open longer because a lot of times there is no housing stock for people to go back to because of the scope of the disaster, but also the lack of housing in their community in general. And then, you know, you, you guys probably are aware of this. Most people don't have uh, hazard insurance and they don't, a lot of people lack the insurance uh, for the basic household needs. Uh, and what we saw last year with the CZU fire in the Monterey areas, we had a number of people who were affected in homes that were not on the, on, on the grid. They were homes that they created themselves that they lived in for years that um, no one knew about. And it was very, very difficult for them to recover since they didn't have insurance. Uh, so these are some of the areas that we're dealing with. Um, I do want to talk about a couple more things and I'll focus more on the intersectionality of, of our work with local government, nonprofits and faith-based. But uh, again, looking at our local impact, we have um, you know almost 56, almost 6,000 volunteers across the Bay Area that help carry out our life-saving work. But of those 5,600, it's probably a, a, a small 10 to 15% of those that do 80% of the work, right? A small number of our volunteers who are committed to almost full-time work. And then we have a large number of episodic volunteers that help out as well. So looking at the work we do, the challenge we always have is there's never enough volunteers, no matter what we do. We can't engage the ones we have fully and the ones, and when we need them, we're not always able to get them. So it's always a constant struggle. And that's why we need, we always look to get help from our partners. Um, again, this is the number we had 1,342 fires, disasters last year in our region. And we've helped 2,500 families, again, with that minimal assistance to get them on the road to recovery. And then we've done a lot around preparedness. I'll talk a little bit more about this in a second, but um, we, we prepared 2,500 community members in disaster preparedness. And this goes back to what you all remember uh, of, you know, build a kit, make a plan, get informed, those three basic steps. Um, but for the Red Cross, we've really had a bit of a shift in our focus to preparedness really being around the home fire. Again, we do so much of this that um, over the past few years, we've really taken a concerted focus on the number of home fires. So seven people every day die from home fires. And at the national level, about eight years ago, we focused our efforts to try and really address this by going into people's homes and when necessary, installing smoke alarms and educating them on how to get out of their home and what the, uh, the normal or the average household disasters might look like and how they could prevent that. We include earthquake and other preparedness, but it's really around how people can um, prepare their homes and prevent uh, a fatality due to a home fire. Uh, so you can see here, we've installed over 2 million alarms nationally. We've made almost 900,000 homes safer. Locally within our region, we've uh, prepared 15,000 homes. We've installed almost 40,000 alarms. And here's the important part that I wanna highlight. We have documented 31 lives saved from this particular effort. 31 lives saved due to the alarms we installed or the education we've done. And when I say we, 
it's the Red Cross, it's the fire departments, it's the nonprofits, it's the faith-based groups, it's everyone. We, we look to partner with everyone in order to do that. So it's not something that we've done on our own. We provide the alarms and the training, but we really rely on our partners to do that. And 31 lives saved, I believe, is a low number. We're not really capturing them all, uh, but those are 31 that we have documented through our process of lives saved. So I, I, I talk about all that in order to give the, the perspective of what it is we do and what the opportunities are, but I, I want to focus on, Scott, what you had asked so to really for us to talk a little bit more about is how we work closely. And I wanted to break this up in terms of how we work with our local government and state partners, and then I'll talk a little bit more about our nonprofit and faith-based partnerships. So, um, and if you know this, I apologize, but from a broader perspective, we are partners with the local governments. Um, it is their responsibility to take care of the care and shelter of their citizens. Um, we are at a national level, co-leads with FEMA on mass care and sheltering. At the state level, we're co-leads. And in most of our counties, we are identified as co-leads either in the plans or in planning. Uh, so because of that, we work with our local governments. We work with this uh, in San Francisco, the Department of Emergency Management, and more specifically, the Human Services Agency, uh, to make sure we have plans where we're going to open shelters, how we're going to respond, who's going to provide feeding, how we're going to do that. Um, and then we conduct drills, we conduct exercises, we do assessments of those facilities that include churches and, not, and um, community centers at, at other locations, so that we're ready to, to respond. Um, we... Um, We've opened up shelters with the city and with the county numerous times in San Francisco and across the Bay Area. And on the large fires, uh, when we had the, the Kincaid fire in Sonoma County, um, the state reached out to, Napa, uh, to Marin County to open up a shelter and they opened up their convention center. Uh, and we had that day, um, we were at over capacity. We had 400 and something people, people in the aisles. And then they asked San Francisco and St. Mary's um, the Cathedral of St. Mary's opened up a shelter, and I wish I was looking for pictures. That was a beautiful, it's probably the most beautiful shelter I've ever seen. It was very, 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 very laid out, well laid out. There were people from HSA, from Department of Health, from Department of Emergency Management. Uh, they had uh, one room for dogs, people with dogs, and one room for people with cats. Uh, it was an example of one of the best shelters I've ever seen. It didn't have a huge population, but it was an example of government and the Red Cross and nonprofits coming together to provide for those people who weren't in San Francisco, but who were escaping the fire and coming to San Francisco. Uh, we, we can do it more recently with fires. We've started focusing on support to temporary evacuation points, and that's where people go before they go on to a shelter or whatever happens. And these are becoming really important due to COVID when we have these large fires because we don't want people indoors, so we try and do these outdoors. It's really just a way, way station to people to go to to evacuate from their homes as we figure out with our government partners, are we opening up a shelter? Are we putting them into hotels or what's the next step? Um, but then we open shelters. Again, I talked a little bit about this before. Um, we, we open shelters in churches. We open shelters in uh, community centers. We also use churches. We used a, a church in Solano County as our headquarters uh, for that area during the Tubbs fire. I was there for two weeks with my team the, the church opened up the rec room and it was just incredibly helpful to have that uh, facility for us to have a local management team there. So there's a number of ways we can work with um, our partners on that. But we opened up, we opened up churches and we opened up uh, community centers for shelters. And the thing with COVID is we, we've tried to reduce the number of people in those shelters. We've spread out how we set up the cots so that there, there's much more space. Uh, and what we're seeing now is fewer people inside shelters, we're seeing a larger population outside the shelters, in their cars, in their trailers, in their RVs, camping out on their own. So we provide support to them as well, but that's something that we're really working with our government partners on. How are we addressing that? How are we identifying shelters that have that space? And then again, we provide the needed resources as much as possible, not just us. We work with our local governments, the state governments to provide um, you know, replacement for SNAP benefits, we uh, replacement for driver's licenses and IDs, and then the financial material resources. Um, I, I want to... Oh, John, ahead, I just wanted to yeah. let you know we have about five minutes left for this okay. part. Of this. I wanted to do a time check. Sure. And, that, and that's including questions or just my presentation? Uh, 
uh, probably including questions. Okay. But, you know, I want to make sure people have plenty of time to talk in their sure. small groups later. Absolutely. So let me let me spend some time on this. So where we work with nonprofits, you know, again, we always are looking for additional shelter space. So if you have a church, a rec room, or if you have a place that you think might be a, a potential shelter location, especially with something with an outdoor area that is ADA accessible, um, that is not already a shelter, something you might be interested in. Um, we look at our partnership with, with faith-based organizations and nonprofits to help get the word out about the Red Cross, especially in migrant communities. A lot of the people who are very affected by these larger fires in, in, the, in the more agricultural areas are afraid to come to the Red Cross, even though they know the Red Cross in their local, their home countries. It's still an issue, and we really are work, we're working hard with our Latino community to try and get the word out so they understand that we are open and um, they can seek help from us. Uh, we work with our faith-based partners on um, meeting the specific cultural, language, and religious needs of the community. Um, again, we rely on our volunteers, but they're not always as um, representative of the community that we serve. We, we do not have as diverse a, a volunteer pool as we would like. And so we always look for volunteers um, to diversify our volunteer ranks, but also partners who can, they don't have to be Red Crossers, but they can help us do casework. They can help us translate. They can remain independent of the Red Cross, but help us do the work we do. And then we also look to our partners to help us identify where we need to be doing our preparedness efforts. Where should we be doing smoke alarm installations? If there's communities around uh, around you that you know of that could, would really benefit from a smoke alarm installation event, let us know and we can help set that up. And we would love to partner with you all to help do that. And I think this is really important. You don't need us to do the work. We can help train and empower you and others to do the work for us or on our behalf or do something similar. Uh, we can't do it all. We definitely want to amplify our effect by training others. And then again, you know, I mentioned this before, given the audience here, spiritual care is something that is becoming much more important. And we always are looking for, um, uh, for volunteers for that. Every single one of these opportunities are things that we currently do with our partners. Again, we have a Latino engagement team that works with our uh, a lot of the migrant communities in Sonoma, Napa, Monterey, Santa Cruz to build that capacity. Um, there is a lot of opportunity for that intersectionality between the faith-based nonprofit and the Red Cross. I mean, I see us as being, along with VOADS, and I know Adrienne is on, going to talk later, I see us and VOADS as that sort of center place where faith-based nonprofits could come work with us and help connect into that local government because we do have at the Red Cross that official role as being that nonprofit partner with, with, with the local government. So um, Scott, I hope that covered what you wanted. And I think I ended on time. I don't know if we have time for questions or if there's anything else you wanted me to talk about, please let me know. Um, thank you, John. That's fantastic. Um, I didn't see any questions in chat, so I guess one of the, I guess the one question I was going to ask you is, is there is there any particular lesson that's been learned during the pandemic, or any gap or opportunity in working with faith communities that became even more evident during the pandemic that would be useful for us to name at this time yeah there there is uh, what we've seen is again it takes longer for people to recover we have people who are evacuating three the third and fourth time from their home due to you know fires reoccurring popping up in the same community so that that sense of of connectedness to the community that sense of faith sometimes is very very challenging to maintain with those in the shelter that's why we are always trying to build our spiritual care um, capacity because we see that as something that um, is really becoming a challenge for us and challenge for those people affected by the disaster. So I think the lessons learned and, and some of the changes we're looking at is um, the response to the fires, which are unprecedented, requires a more nuanced and personal response to help those people affected. Um, we're trying to figure this out. We're trying to understand what that looks like. And as we do, we look to our partners who are in those communities to help us 
identify that. We don't know what we don't know. A lot of times we focus on food, shelter, and stuff. And there's so much more that people need. We know they need that. We're not the expert in that. There are opportunities for us to work with you all and others to help us figure out what those needs are. And we're not, we're not above someone coming to us saying, we know you have a shelter open. Can we offer this? Can we help you with this? Um, we need to be open to that because we cannot do it alone. And we know there's more to this than, than we understand. We're getting more and more knowledgeable about it, but we don't have the skill set, and we need to partner with others to do that. John, I have a question. We have an active St. Vincent de Paul program in our parish, and we also are part of Winter Nights. How do I get our people in touch with you so there might be some coordination there? So I can, I know, Scott, you want to move on. So Scott, I, I think you have my contact information. If you could share it with others, feel free to email me. We have people who we have program managers in each of our counties I can connect you with. But for the sake of time, uh, I'll give my information to Scott. And you can connect to me through him. What one question that I would like to ask, you don't necessarily have to answer the question, just that information. How are you organized across all the counties in 15 counties that you work? How do I... Who do I contact? Is there an office here? So if you send out a document that says, these are all the different you know, locations and coordinators that we can reach, I think that'll be very helpful. We'll distribute it to everyone who participated. Yeah, so real quick, again, Scott, I apologize. I want to move on. 15 counties, we're broken into 10, what we call territories. And those are a combination of one or two counties. And we have a program manager for each one. I have a contact sheet that I'll provide to Scott. Scott, if you can help me share it with everyone else breaks down the names of those individuals, which counties they cover and their contact information, that would be the best way to reach out to them. Or you can reach out to me and I can connect you with them. And they would be the first step. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you so much, John. Uh, we appreciate that to really ground us in our talk for today. Thank you, everyone. And um, there will, uh, Will McGarvey, who sent you the registration today, everybody, You'll get a follow-up email afterwards and we'll have John's information, his sheet uh, with information about a Red Cross structure across the Bay Area. And there'll also be a handout about VOADs. We're about to hear on VOADs in just a moment, but there'll be a, a contact sheet for your local VOAD. They'll also come out in the email after this meeting. So um, let's move on right now. Um, again, thank you so much, John, uh, particularly for uh, coming forward and and helping us today. And let's take a moment to, uh, and you see actually in the chat, you'll see the uh, VOADs, uh, we'll just put a link um, in the chat that has that document. So you can go ahead and download it now if you want. Uh, we're talking about VOADs in just a minute, but um, it'll also be the email that comes out to you afterwards. So right now we're gonna do a poll. Uh, let's do a poll to help prepare our way for a panel discussion that's coming up. So if you just take a moment to um, fill out the poll, please. All right, so maybe another uh, give another minute if you take time to fill out the poll, please. Hmm. Some people say that the poll disappeared.
I have some experience speak. with this, Scott, and what happened was one of the co-hosts pushed the, we're done with the poll, show the results button. So why don't you try it again? And this time, none of the people that are co-hosts touch any buttons other than answering the polls, and it probably will work. How do you answer I'll, the I'll, poll? I'll relaunch it right now. If I can give everyone one more minute, one second. Is and while we're um, while we're waiting for the poll uh, to come out again, maybe we can have Biff Barnard from the URI who gave us some of the funds for today's meeting, and also hopefully our work together on disaster relief and other things can share a brief greeting. Thanks, Will. Uh, I know many of you. Uh, my name is Biff Barnard. I'm currently the active active uh, acting executive director of URI. And as you know, all the cooperation circles in the Bay Area are, are all the interfaith councils are URI cooperation circles. We've been talking for years about having the cooperation circles in the Bay Area work more closely together. We're thrilled that this is maybe a start of uh, more opportunities for us all to get together. Uh, we're so honored that you all are cooperation circles, that you're, the work you're doing in, in your areas um, we're just real proud of, of you and proud that you're cooperation circles and would welcome the opportunity to be a resource for you in, in, in your work. Um, so uh, thank you very much for what you're doing. Thanks for including us. Thanks for being part of URI. Thank you, Biff. And thank you also to URI for this amazing support uh, making this possible today. Um, Herb, let's go ahead and close the poll and share some, let's share results. It is not letting me share results. It's saying, right. uh, I'll, I'll, I'll read through the results for us. Got it. So, um, question number one, does your faith community or organization have a disaster plan? 45% uh, said yes, 55% said no. What emergency or disaster events are you most concerned about? And this was multiple choice, so you could select more than one. Um, most common was fires, 85%. 75% said earthquake. Uh, pandemic and drought came in third place, both at 55%. Uh, floods, 15%, sea level rise, 15%. And how prepared do you feel personally for the next disaster? 65% said moderately prepared. 15% said mostly prepared. And then 10% said unprepared and 10% said greatly prepared. So thank you everybody for uh, participating in the poll, and that provides us a little bit of uh, personal information and group information as we head into our panel discussion. So next we have our uh, panelists who are going to address uh, the expectations of faith communities and disaster and where gaps or opportunities might exist. Uh, each one is going to have five minutes to talk, and I'll ring the bell uh, when the five minutes is up. Uh, so our first speaker is going to be Adriana Rapkin, who's the director for the Marin VOAD. VOAD is Voluntary Organizations Active in Disaster. She's new to the world of disaster services, having entered into the field in January 2018. Prior to leading the Marin VOAD, she was a senior manager of operations for Universal Giving, a clearinghouse for volunteer and don donation opportunities with NGOs around the world. Um, she is from New York City, but is living in Marin since 2008 with her husband, two teenage boys, and Pippa, their family dog. Second, we will have Reverend Michael Pappas, who in 2007 was selected by the San Francisco Interfaith Council to the newly created administrative post of executive director. In his tenure as executive director, Michael has helped increase the council's budget and program substantially, strengthen existing and cultivated new relationships with civic leaders, NGOs, judicatories and congregations, and significantly projected uh, San Francisco Interfaith Council through expanded use of technology. 
And finally, we will have Reverend Will McGarvey, who has served as Executive Director of the Interfaith Council of Contra Costa County for the last nine years. And he also serves as part-time pastor of the Ecumenical East County Shared Ministry in Pittsburgh, California. So thanks in advance to all of our panelists, and we're going to start with Adriana, who will address what a VOAD is and why it is important. Thank you, Scott, and uh, thank you, everybody, for letting me join um, today. I'm going to just share two very brief slides with you to keep us on schedule. Um, so Marine VOAD, as Scott said, Voluntary Organizations Active in Disaster. And you will find that there are VOADs in all of your different counties. Um, let me just give you a quick overview about what VOADs are. Um, VOADs are a collaboration of community-based organizations. This can be nonprofit, faith-based, other community organizations, um, and government agencies. In Marin, it's both local and county government and different departments, different agencies within the government. VOADs connect all of these groups and build a collaborative network to support the community following a disaster and during recovery. Um, you heard from John that we tend to, most VOADs tend to partner with Red Cross and other organizations like them. They can be national or international disaster service providers. They can be your local agencies and organizations within your county that help um, vulnerable residents um, all over. Um, and that's what a VOAD is. It's this collection, it's this collaboration of everybody who provides disaster services so that we're all connected and coordinated um, in the response. What's fascinating about VOADs is they are part of a larger system. Um, there's a national VOAD that was started in 1970. There are, <clears throat> excuse me, state and local VOADs. There are Bay Area VOADs in absolutely every county. Um, and if they haven't started, it just takes a disaster for them to get kicked off. Um, and I have heard that Mendocino and Lake and some other counties are trying to start their VOADs um, because what everybody recognizes is that a VOAD makes uh, the county and the area more resilient. Um, so we're part of this national network, which means that there are disaster service providers who come in from everywhere looking to help. Um, it means that there are resources beyond your county. Um, and to the point of this conversation where we have different counties communicating, that's a very important feature of VOADs is that we all help each other. We have this very extensive network of resources and information and um, come together in a disaster and during a recovery period where everybody steps in to help. VOADs themselves do not provide disaster services, but we help coordinate all of the partners that do provide the services. And this is to ensure that people are cared for, that resource needs are met, that there's no duplication of effort. Um, we work in both disaster preparedness so that you can become prepared, so that you know who your partners are, how everyone works together, and then we're better off in disaster response. Um, there's the saying that I'm sure many of you have heard, it's better to get business cards before the disaster than during it. Um, and that's what VOADs are about. They focus on disaster preparedness in order to help with the response. And what we do is help ensure that communities are stronger. Um, this is by identifying needs, um, identifying resources that are available, filling those gaps. And as I've said, working with nonprofit, faith-based and government partners to fill the gaps, help vulnerable residents um, and make sure that communities are more resilient. And in order to keep us on track, I'm just gonna leave you with this. And if you want more about the VOAD, come join my breakout room afterwards. Um, but why are VOADs important? The local, state, and federal government voluntary agencies and others involved in disasters are like individual sandbags. Alone, they cannot stop the flood, but together, they are like an impenetrable wall of safety and security. I encourage all of you to collaborate. It's what strengthens our community. It's what builds resi resilience, and it, it's what makes us more effective during a disaster. And I will leave you there. Thank you, Adriana. Your timing was absolutely perfect. And so next we're gonna hear from uh, Michael Pappas, who's gonna to talk to us about the 
regional response to meet spiritual care needs during the wildfires in Santa Rosa and Sonoma and what we learned from that. Thank you, Scott. And I will try to be as faithful as Adriana was. Um, you know, interfaith councils come into existence uh, for different reasons, mostly in response to crises. Ours in San Francisco was essentially called into existence by city government to respond to a homeless crisis and a year later to respond to the uh, Loma Prieta earthquake. And I have to tell you, when I took this position 14 years ago, uh, I was thinking of the 800 communities of faith and religious institutions in San Francisco, and I was losing sleep because uh, I was wondering if power is down and we are isolated for 72 hours, um, how are we going to be able to communicate with one another? Uh, and since then, uh, really the, uh, the, the, the crises that we've had to respond to have been wild, wildfires and a pandemic. Uh, I, was, I was really pleased to see that 85% of the folks uh, responding to the poll uh, re, uh, were concerned about fires because I think the wildfires in 2017 and 2018, the tubs and the campfire, uh, those two really kind of changed the way that we, uh, we function as interfaith councils in the Bay Area. Um, and just for your information, over 36,000, almost close to 37,000 acres burned uh, during those fires. Uh, and almost 5,700 structures were, uh, were destroyed. Uh, I remember vividly uh, sitting in a cafe on Chestnut Street in San Francisco with a clergy colleague. And I remember uh, seeing specks of dust coming into that cafe. Uh, and, and it was just a reminder of the regional nature of fires. What happened uh, shortly after that is, I started getting calls from the director of the Department of Emergency Management in San Francisco, as well as our, our colleagues over at the Salvation Army and others wanting to know who to talk to up in Sonoma County, who is my, who is my counterpart, as well as in Marin County where the evacuees were presenting themselves. And so I realized that the 30 years of relationship building that we did uh, was, ever so important. And so we were able to make those vital introductions uh, because the Department of Emergency Management in San Francisco was deploying help up to Sonoma County and yes, again, in Marin. Um, shortly after that, uh, we received word from the Salvation Army that you know people who had to be evacuated uh, were really traumatized and needed spiritual care. And we began a very hurried um, effort to dispatch uh, clergy up as chaplains. Um, and it, it happened very quickly. Um, and we just kind of put the word out and send people up. Um, some, of the, uh, some of the instances that, and, and the reports that came back were that some of the, some of the clergy were not prepared for uh, what it was that they had to encounter. And, um, and, and there were some issues of cultural competency. And so what we did was uh, when the literal dust settled, uh, <clears throat> we convened uh, my counterparts in the different counties, uh, as well as our friends from the Salvation Army Red Cross and uh, the Southern Baptist Conference, which was providing the food uh, for, for the evacuees to, to do a debrief. And it was an important debrief because what we realized is that uh, we needed to have in place for future events, a way not only to vet those who we were sending up as chaplains, but as well to have a training prior to. And that began a series of meetings uh, and looking at resources that were available uh, to be able to, to undergo these, uh, this important vetting and training process. Uh, we worked very closely with the Red Cross on this and we uh, began to engage the Chaplaincy Institute at Berkeley for this as well. Um, uh, as we were proceeding with this process, the pandemic hit and we had to shift gears, uh, but uh, 
it, it was an important time because I will tell you, uh, up until these fires, uh, we were, many of us, many of our, our interfaith councils, although we were connected and we were having an exchange professionally, um, we were not working interdependently. And we realized how important that was. And these fires really uh, changed the nature of our work from silos to regional work and, uh, and, and, and for the better. Uh, and so I, I really think that um, moving forward, what we're experiencing here today, this conference in particular, uh, was born out of that realization that we need to be here for one another. Because what, what Sonoma County uh, experienced, as well as uh, Marin County, where the evacuees uh, presented themselves, uh, tomorrow could be San Francisco needing to, uh, to rely on our neighbors. And so conferences like this are very important for us to be able to uh, prepare in advance because our work is preparedness, response, and recovery. Thank you so much, Michael. Uh, it's been such a joy to collaborate with you on all of that. Mm -hmm. um, Finally, we're going to hear from Will McGarvey, who is going to talk to us about an Interfaith Council Disaster Network. Will. So you Hi. can imagine um, th that uh, in our gatherings as interfaith leaders, um, and especially executive directors around the Bay Area, when we meet and we're considering all of the different needs of of uh, what might be coming our way, as well as um, internally displaced Californians from other faith communities around the, the, the state with all of the fires. Um, it's it's a, uh, a little different to, uh, to us in the East Bay. We have a little different relationship than San Francisco with disaster because San Francisco was born out of the Loma Prieta earthquake our interfaith council was born out of uh, uh, becoming interfaith out of a council of churches. And while there were some uh, disaster uh, events in our past, not nothing that really stuck and has become a part of our institutional culture. So we had to basically uh, try to create a network from the ground up. And one of the ways that we did it here in Contra Costa was creating our own interfaith disaster preparedness network. And we would host events like this uh, and asking our congregations, is your congregation ready to help your congregants and neighbors in the case of a large scale emergency? Does your congregation already have policies in place about what to do in case of fires, earthquakes, floods, or shooters, active shooting events? Uh, so security is a part of, uh, of this as well, especially for our congregations that have been targeted by those. Um, do you have trained congregants ready to serve with the Red Cross or your city's CERT teams if your congregation needs to be a site for sheltering others? And so we've hosted events like this where, um, where we'll have someone present on uh, different things like uh, a congregational uh, emergency plan. And um, here's one that we've been given permission to be able to share from Clayton Valley Presbyterian Church and just as an example, you can see that there's an introduction um, uh, training, how they're planning on training it and overseeing fire, earthquakes, severe storm, flooding, medical and intruder or shooter, lockdowns, threats, and then appendices for where is our uh, area of refuge or storm shelter areas? Where are our fire alarms and fire control? Exit and entrance door numbering, utility shutoffs, equipment property that requires attention, emergency shutoff locations, copy of the Children's Center's emergency disaster plan for their preschool. Um, these are all the different kinds of things that congregations need to be thinking about and our organizations need to be thinking about as well because if we're not thinking about how our organization is going to be able to continue during an emergency like this, the pandemic has shown us exactly how much more difficult it can be if there's other health uh, uh, events and other health uh, concerns to take into consideration as we're doing that. So a lot of this work has been uh, cataloging a little bit, uh, especially since there's so many microclimates in our different parts of my county where our 109 congregations, monasteries, and retreat centers work together. How do we um, how do we just know who has the big parking lots where RVs might be able to 
uh, stay and be able to be uh, a house, uh, a quick pop-up housing shelter for other folks. Um, how do we, um, how do we uh, just know which congregations are more prepared, which ones are already Red Cross certified with their social halls to be emergency shelters and working with our county VOAD. So I, I'm on our county VOAD and sometimes Michael Tejada, who's a part of our uh, conversation today, represents us there. And we try to keep all of those lines of communication going as much as possible. And in times of emergency, uh, just knowing where the places uh, of first possibility would be are, are among the things that we try to do. But we'll just talk a little bit about wh what are some things that if you want to create something from the ground up, how do you encourage congregations as, as well as individuals to do this work of preparation so that we can be ready when it happens and especially be uh, know what communication channels work for each other so that we can stay in communication when that communication is hardest. Thank you. Thank you so much, Will. What a, a rare interfaith event where each speaker actually sticks to their time. It's fantastic. It's so well disciplined. Thank you. Um, and Will, did you say that that um, church's um, plan is something that can be shared with potentially everyone who joined today? Is that, did I hear that right? Um, I can share a couple of these. Um, each of these congregational plans are different. One's more focused on fire because the congregation, First Congregational Church of Berkeley, has experienced more fire than even they should have. Then they're allotted fires over the years. So they become kind of experts in that. And Clayton Valley Presbyterian has been happy to share theirs as well. And I can share that uh, in the chat room as PDFs in the, the next minute or so. Great. Thank you, Will. Um, so we have about five minutes for any questions that anyone wants to put in chat for any of our panelists. We already do have one question in chat from Thea, and this is addressed to Michael. Um, Michael, are there any pagans or Wiccans in the, the spiritual care response program? And, and, you know, and I responded directly to Thea. Um, you, you know, the San Francisco Interfaith Council is primarily a congregational based um, uh, council. So we don't have active active, but we do have, uh, and, and he is on this uh, call now, uh, an indigenous uh, representative and Andy Galvin who uh, is on our board. And so, uh, so there is that, yes. I, and, I, you know, one of the things I wanted to, to kind of accentuate that I didn't get a chance to say in the, in the program was that, you know, there were a lot of people up in the fires uh, who had some dietary restrictions. And, um, and so we had to basically in our debrief, take a look at, you know, especially our Muslim sisters and brothers uh, up, up and, and, and sensitize some of our friends at the Southern Baptist Conference who were providing the meals. Um, and, and I think that these are important things that we need to, uh, to be very, very conscious of uh, moving forward. I think we, we learn lessons every time we try to do good. And, uh, and I think that this was one of the lessons that we needed to, that we needed to address. I don't see any other questions in chat at this time. Let's. Can I just mention one brief thing that Please. when we've when we've tried to be able to create training for spiritual leaders, we really need leaders from various faith traditions to go through these trainings so that we have folks from the various faith traditions that have the cultural competency to be able to be able to serve the folks as they desire, as they need. It's it's um, it's like the difference between the golden rule and the platinum rule, right? The golden rule is um, we treat others the way that you want to be treated, but the platinum rule is harder and it's more um, closer to that cultural competency because it asks us to treat people the way they want to be treated. And that means we have to meet them and know them and perhaps do some training to be able to be prepared to be able to meet their spiritual needs in that moment without projecting our own needs. So um, fortunately, we've been able to partner with the San Francisco Police Department, which has offered some of those trainings, but we'd like to do more of that. And the pandemic got in the way of us being able to do that, but that's one of our hopes for the future. So Thea, we certainly invite you and 
feel free to email me. I know we have each other's email already, but um, if you want to be part of that, because um, we'd certainly appreciate your um, insights and participation and, and certainly and need else. your diversity and your expertise to, to share with the rest of the group so that we know best how to serve pagans, Wiccans and others, um, uh, especially solitary pra practitioners of their faith traditions. I, I received a direct message from uh, Mihir uh, Megani, uh, uh, my Hindu brother, and, and he, you know, the Hindus are so wonderful at providing mass meals at, at like the, the former parliaments for the world's religions. And I think when you raise these needs, uh, the response of people like me here, me here are, are wonderful. And so I think that, you know, we have our, our work cut out for us in terms of kind of expressing those needs and then also looking at our communities and seeing how they can help be part of the response. Thank you. Well, in just a moment, we're going to go into breakout rooms, but Adriana, I just wanted to give you a chance. Is there anything that you heard from Michael or Will or anything additional to add that either you wanted to draw out or you wanted to respond to or a question that arose in your mind? Um, I think the most important thing for everybody is just to recognize that um, collaboration is critical, uh, however it is, right? Whatever the connections are, it, it really doesn't matter, but um, it, none of us can do this alone. Um, none of us can respond <clears throat> to disaster alone. We're all gonna be stronger if we're connected and we know how we work with one another. And so the only, the only thing, <clears throat> excuse me, the only thing that I would encourage everybody to do is find one more person to connect to. Um, because that one person will know two more and, you know, that's how we're going to build a stronger community. And Adriana, I just would say that, you know, so many of our interfaith councils are part of our local VOADs. And so, you know, it's not just you talking over there and, and, and me being over here. We are very much part of that. Anytime you turn on the television set anywhere in the world, you see faith communities are always there at, at the sites. Of, of disasters because we have the facilities, we know how to mobilize volunteers and it's in our DNA. And, and the VOAD is so critical in terms of really coordinating all of us so that we're not tripping over one another and that we're doing the good that is needed. Right, and I'm, I'm well aware of that. Um, and I think that's the beauty of all of these different collaborative groups. VOADs are connected within themselves. So I'm connected with all of the different uh, regional Bay Area VOADs and some go by COADs. I know that, that interfaith councils are connected. And so that I know, I know that if Scott and I need to work on something together, he's going to go through his network. I'm going to go through my network. And together we have a very strong regional response. I couldn't agree with you more, Michael. So thank you, dear panelists. Um, what we have a chance now is for all of you who are participating to have a deeper dive into one of these three topics, and then also to be able to talk with each other about those three topics. So we're gonna do breakout rooms again, according to topic. And let me go ahead and put up a PowerPoint slide that hopefully will make this a little uh, clearer. So in just a moment, uh, you're going to be invited to join one of three breakout rooms. So Adriana is going to lead one on VOAD. So if you wanna learn more about what a VOAD or COAD is, how they function, how you can participate, how this is really the, the hub for the receiving of information about resources that are available or resources that are needed, kind of how your faith community can um, step forward to help, or if you're noticing needs that are coming forward that needs to be passed on, they're the, the liaison between uh, the government response and our faith communities, that's the great uh, work of a VOAD. So if you wanna find out more about that and take a deeper dive in that, join the VOAD um, breakout room with Adriana. If you wanna take a deeper dive into spiritual care, and as Michael mentioned, a pause got put on the really active um, training and all the work we're doing because of the pandemic, but it needs to be, it will be um, reinvigorated. 
And we already learned a lot from the North Bay fires a few years ago. So a lot of work has already been done, but uh, there's a lot more work to do. So if you want to take uh, a look into the spiritual care that we can offer regionally and coordinate regionally and have training regionally and then deployed regionally, if you want to be part of that conversation, join Michael for spiritual care. And then if you want to take a deeper dive into Interfaith Council Disaster Network, as Will talked about, and how your interfaith council or interfaith organization can be a, a conduit of, of education for faith communities and help them develop their own disaster plans for congregations and also provide information for individuals and providing um, in those congregations for preparing themselves. Um, all of that kind of work that Will talked about and the great work they've done in Contra Costa County and how your interfaith council can take that in its own direction, replicate that, make it more appropriate for your locality. Join Will for that conversation. So those are your three options, VOAD, Spiritual Care, Interfaith Council, Disaster Network. So in just a moment, you're going to receive an invitation to join a breakout room. So if you see the invitation to join a breakout room, accept it. And then you're going to click on one of the named rooms. So you'll see, you'll see a number of breakout rooms, but you're going to choose one of the first three. And they're going to be named VOAD, Spiritual Care, and Interfaith Council or IC Disaster Network. Okay. So when you look, you accept the invitation, join a breakout room, and you'll see a bunch of breakout rooms. And the, you want to join one of the first three. So VOAD, Spiritual Care, or Interfaith Council Disaster Network, whichever one you're most interested in. Okay. So click on one of those first named rooms and click join when you get the invitation, okay? So join a breakout room, accept that, and then you'll see these three named rooms. Click on the one that you want and click join. So that'll be the next step. If for some reason you don't see the invitation, then it, you may have to hover around your Zoom window and you'll see at the very bottom, there's an invitation where you can click on uh, more. And so that will be um, that'll be a chance where you'll be able to see the, the breakout rooms. Um, or it may you may just see the, you see in this one here, there's also breakout rooms. So anyway, if you, for some reason you don't get the invitation, just hover around the bottom of your Zoom screen and you should see either breakout rooms with a little like one, it's kind of a notification, hey, join a breakout room. Or you'll see um, the um, you'll see the opportunity at the bottom to, um, to, do, to do that. So either by more or by join breakout room. All right, so right now we're gonna have a chance to do that. And if for some reason you can't find the invitation. Um, it looks like Scott, the breakout room, someone pressed it by mistake. And it's pulling us into uh, our old rooms. Gotcha. So yeah, anybody who's a co-host, don't. <laughs> um, yeah, let's. We're gonna have to start over the breakout room. So Herb's gonna close them. They're yeah, they're closing. So again, in just a moment, you'll get the invitation to join a breakout room. Choose the room that you want. If you don't see the invitation around the bottom, hover around the bottom of your screen and you should see a little either breakout rooms or the word more. Click on that and there will be your invitation. If for some reason it doesn't work for you, don't worry. Just hang out in the, in the main room and then Herb and I will sort you into whatever room you want to go to. All right. Am I in the room? Okay, so Herb, if, when you have a moment, if you could read do our invitations for chat. And if, again, if for some reason it doesn't work, don't worry, we will sort you. Scott, it's reassigning everyone to the original rooms that were uploaded. Oh. Uh, let, me, let me see. Let me, let me create all rooms. Maybe he needs a sorting hat. Can you put me in room two? This, this, I mean, the order, the order. Yeah, if, everybody, if everybody goes into mute, please, um, Herb and I will sort this out. All right, let's see. 
if you want to just rename rooms one, two, and three, right, then people can. Let sort me of... let me try to do this real quick. It's not going to let you choose, Scott, because of the the pre-assigned. Let me just hold on a second. Let's see what happens. All right, so um, I noticed a lot of you are still in the room, so no problem. Let me just call on you one by one, and you can tell me either VOAD, Spiritual Care, or um, Interfaith Council, or just say Disaster Network, okay? So, Sherna, uh, which one do you want to go to? Um, spiritual Care, please. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm, let me not say your name correctly. Um, Somanjana? Um, Chatterjee? Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, I would like to go to spiritual care as well. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Leslie, Leslie Meehan. Go ahead, please. Girish. Girish? Disaster Network. Okay. Me here. The web. Debbie, Debbie Low Skinner. Spiritual care. Elizabeth Yuri. The web. Thanks, Scott. Sure. Father Jerry. Uh, we'll come back to Father Jerry. Uh, Diane Fisher. Go oh, ahead, please. Uh, Lynn. Lynn Oldham Robinette. Spiritual care. Great. Welcome back, everybody. Thank you for your participation in our breakout rooms. And it was just the start of a conversation. We plan to have more of these gatherings, but we also want to honor your time and end on time. And so what I want to do now is get a brief report from our three panelists, our three uh, breakout room leaders, just to give us a, a summary uh, in a minute or two of what uh, transpired in your room, anything you'd like to share, any highlights. Um, Adriana. Uh, there we go. Sorry, I was just quickly putting my email um, in the chat as somebody in our group had asked. 
Um, we spoke, uh, so, so we talked a little bit more about the VOAD and um, VOADs in different areas. Um, and then I asked our, our group what they need to build collaboration in their larger community. And that was really the one question that we stayed focused on. Um, and some things that came up were, uh, it's hard to get people prepared. Um, you have to focus on an event or, um, you know, a little, a little uh, uh, compelling reason um, for people to want to be prepared. Um, there's also behaviors that have to be changed and giving people one small step at a time is a much more effective way of getting them to personally be prepared and understand that disaster can strike here. Um, you know, even if it has not shown up in your back, in, in your neighborhood um, or your backyard, um, it is there. And so how do we get people to recognize that? That was another, another topic that came up in Marin where, you know, many of us are very aware of the drought and we're reducing our water. That may not be the case in other parts of California. Um, and so this idea of um, sharing the messaging, getting people to realize that certain things are imminent, um, and then at the same time, simplifying it, right? Not overwhelming people with what are the steps that they have to take. One thing at a time is a great way of helping people um, get prepared. Uh, we also recognized that it really is a village um, and reaching out to um, just a faith organization or just a nonprofit um, is not enough because their reach is only going to be so many people. Um, so we talked a little bit about how being part of a VOAD or being part of an interfaith council, which is also connected to its VOAD, um, is critical because in Marin VOAD's case, we reach leaders of their different communities. And the idea is this sort of pyramid structure where I may reach, in this case, Scott Quinn, Marin Inter Interfaith Council. And if the messaging is about a particular disaster or situation, Scott will then push it out to everybody within the Interfaith Council. And the hope is that all of those faith leaders push it out to their residents, even if it's only 15, right? Even if it's only a small community in a particular neighborhood, it doesn't matter because that pyramid structure allows us to reach more people. Um, and when we come together in that disaster and share what's going on, we get the same information, we get the same message, we're all on board together, we're working together, and then we can push out the messaging to the residents. We can find out what they need and together we're, we're providing a better response. I hope I covered it in my group. If there's anything that uh, you all feel that I missed, please let me know. Thank you, Adriana. Michael. Sure. What, what struck me just in retrospect in our group is, you know, spiritual care transcends particular crises. Uh, so here we were talking about spiritual care, not only in the midst of the fires, but also in the midst of the pandemic and, and the particular needs. Um, we heard uh, from one particular community about the need for online mental health resources. Um, and I know that that's happening now with the Institute on Aging's Friendship Line and trying from an equity perspective to be able to make those applicable to particular communities, vulnerable communities, especially communities of color in need. We, we spoke about what a resource ING could be to, um, to say the Southern Baptist Conference and sensitizing them to the not only the dietary needs of people who are traumatized uh, and, and are going to be in need in times of disaster, but why those are happening. It could be really a teaching opportunity. Uh, Scott was wonderful in coming in. Uh, we, we really tried to talk and, and, and see what, um, you know, what the needs were of folk who, uh, you know, the, in terms of training, uh, the, the issue of training and vetting of, of chaplains was a big portion of our conversation. Um, and again, you know, how everything was sort of halted when the pandemic hit, you know, we were in process uh, of, of, of identifying curricula and also, uh, you know, vetting 
at standards. And uh, so, you know, it was sort of a push. And once, once, once we get back, once the, the pandemic uh, settles, the importance of doing that post haste. Um, I think I covered most of it. Did Scott, you were in the room? Did I miss anything? I think that that covered it well, Michael. Thank okay. you. Will. Thanks, everyone. Um, so I shared a little more in depth about two congregational preparedness plans that are very different and complementary of each other. And um, one was very good in showing where all of their emergency turnoffs are, as well as where they would go during a fire or an emergency on their campus. And the other one was a little more fire centric, but also had really great, clear lines of responsibility for head ushers, the chief, the, the lead minister of the day, for the assistant minister, the assistant ushers. They even put um, uh, the place where a specific usher was responsible for an exit during an emergency evacuation on the back of their usher name tag. And both of those are inside of the chat room. I also added the flyer for one of our interfaith disaster preparedness network trainings and open houses that we had had at uh, Congregation B'nai Shalom in Walnut Creek, which included information about the emergency plans, how to do security and intruder plans, but also even how to uh, join the county's EMS and other kinds of things. And the, the questions, I didn't get a, a chance. We had a smaller group. I'll just put in the chat room. Does your congregation or organization have an emergency plan that addresses emergency fire, earthquake, flash flood, or water leak, gas leak, sea level rise? And we know that that's depending on your proximity to the ocean, but also chemical leak from a nearby refinery or plant. We are seeing more of those, especially in uh, the East Bay. Um, who are your most natural partners, secular and faith-based inside your county? Who would you call first if there was a fire in the neighborhood of your congregation? One of the things I'll just lift up is that all of this preparation work begins personally, congregationally, then maybe um, who are the closest congregations to you that you should be partnering with and maybe sharing your emergency plan with them and maybe creating one plan for your work together, especially for if there's a larger um, uh, movement of people and displacing of people in an earthquake, how would you use the space between your buildings before your social hall got approved by your county to be opened? Those kinds of questions need to be answered inside your, uh, inside your congregational plan. And um, just move from grassroots a little bit further out and grow to become a part of whatever network you can help create in your own county. Thank you, Will. Um, definitely wish to have um, opportunity for, for more sharing and we have some little more details about that coming up about a future gathering. And uh, thank you to Will and to Adriana, to Michael. Uh, just remember, we will be sending out an email after this with follow-up documents and next steps, but invite you just for, just for 15 seconds, just take a moment and determine for yourself what is the one small doable step that you're going to take after this meeting? What's one small doable step that you will commit to personally to do as a result of this meeting? Would you like us to answer that? Uh, you can put that in chat. Okay. If you want to put that in chat, that would be great. So just what's one small doable step that you will do after this meeting? And if you just want to put that in chat to inspire us all. Um, so um, thank you, everybody. We are now going to have our closing. And it's going to be provided by um, Mona Scheich, who's from the Interfaith Council of Alameda County and the Tri-City Interfaith Council. Moina. Thank you, Scott. Peace be with all of you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank all of you for taking the time to be here today. And of course, thanks to all our speakers, John Ruiz, Adriana, Michael Pappas, Will McGarvey. I want to thank Herb Taylor for handling all of our Zoom logistics today. I want to thank, thank Scott Quinn for taking the lead on this event today and helping us through. 
and our gratitude to the United Religions Initiative for providing funding for our gathering. Our intention is to hold these gatherings two or three times per year. For now, by Zoom, of course, until we can safely gather in person, which I hope soon. Please mark your calendars for our next gathering, which is scheduled for the morning of Wednesday, February 2nd. Also, the Parliament of the World's Religions meet virtually later this month on October 16th through the 18th. Join us on Sunday, October 17th at 7 a.m. local time for a panel discussion on our Bay Area Interfaith Councils. Collaboration in a post-COVID world as a way forward for faith organization. That is all we will have, we, we all have been doing together today. So in closing, as a Muslim, we believe in working together. Even for little things, we are instructed to consult and work with others. For something like the pandemic, Prophet Muhammad 1400 years ago said, when you hear that, that a plague is in a land, do not go to it. And if it occurs in a land that you're already in, then do not leave, then do not leave it, fleeing from it. So we could keep each other safe. We need to prepare. We can't depend on others to do something, but work together. Life is sacred. After all, we are all children of the same God. Your God and mine is the same. He didn't give us the choice to be born in the home we were sent to. We are all the same. Cannot emphasize that enough. In his divine, divine plan, he wanted us all to be different so we won't get bored of each other and have challenges in life. This pandemic has definitely brought us together. We have been busy feeding and taking care of the needs of others. We have worked together and will continue to do so. I will share some of the quotes that I jotted down from my colleagues today. Father Caprio said, we need to repair the world. Vilma, she said, we are one body with many members. We need to be here for one another, Michael Pappas. Stay in communication with each other and treat people how they want to be treated, Will McGarvey. Collaboration is critical. We will be strong if we are connected, Adriana. God bless you all. Thank you again for being here today. And th with that, we end our event. Blessed be. Amen. Thanks for participating, folks. And we hope to do these every three months, maybe three times a year, probably not in the summer, but we need to stay in contact to keep these relationships going. So hope to see you soon. Okay. Well, thank you for the uh, Zoom mechanics. Uh, very <laughs> much appreciated. <laughs> thank you. Th this was thanks. Thanks, Scott and Herb too, because they were what made this work today with the complexities in creating what we wanted to create today. But it worked. It worked. Okay.